Uh, kia ora tato. Um, I'm not sure where I'm going to get to. Alistair, I have a problem for you. I'm going to introduce another force in the treaty. <laughs> um, and that will become obvious as we go through. While accepting the three, there's very much another force. Now, I've been doing some work with the, for the Ministry of Ed with schools because of the new curriculum. And we have a phenomenon in New Zealand schools that we didn't discover, but we've called it treaty fatigue, which means that by the time that kids get to year 11, 12, 13, their views of New Zealand history, and not just the treaty, have been somewhat like this. Oh, we had the treaty, and we had the treaty again, and we had the treaty again, and now I know everything there is to know about the treaty, and I'm seven, I can stop thinking about the treaty forevermore. And I find this both saddening and surprising, <laughs> because I've been thinking about the treaty for decades, <laughs> And I'm still having little epiphanies as I think about things and rethink about things. And a year ago, Ned and Sam and I did a seminar as part of the NZHA. Remember those online conferences? Thank heavens we're all together. Where we had this seminar on the treaty very much as a reaction to Ruth Ross. And Ruth Ross has been very much a problem for all of us in different ways. Um, and at the end of it, I felt really dissatisfied. I'd kind of written a chapter for this general history on the treaty, and I spent the summer revisiting it and revisiting the history of the event itself. And that's what, that, that revisiting is what I'm going to talk about today. So the, how I kind of think is that I kind of find problems that I nut away, that don't make any sense to me and that I need to explain. And these are some of the questions that I was going around in my mind about a year ago. Why did the low whites want to send Hobson packing? Now the term low whites is used by Henry Williams and he uses it to describe at particular points in the treaty process. He says, Hobson hadn't got ashore more than half an hour and low whites tried to persuade Māori that they were slaves and their land had gone. And then he also uses it to describe the evening meeting of the 5th, when Hobson's gone back to the ship. So he's quite specific about events where these low whites. So what do we mean by low whites? Because we're meaning the hoi polloi, those supposed depraved members of the hellhole of the Pacific who were hanging around Kōrerārika at the time. Um, and I want to kind of tease out what, those, what that group actually is, and that's what I've been looking at over the last 12 months. And then why did Māori speakers talk about the land as gone? Now, if you've ever followed the Waitangi Tribunal's discussion about pre-1840 purchases, you'll find a very strong Māori statement. We didn't sell the land. We only gifted it. We only provided it temporarily. It was, it was under tikanga that did not acknowledge sale. So why in Rangatira on the 5th saying the land is gone? It's gone to the Pākehā. It's gone to Henry Williams. And that seemed to be something that needed to be explaining. And then fundamentally there's still that question which Ned safely bypasses by saying the English side of the treaty <laughs> or the British side of the treaty, the Crown side of the treaty, that still that problem is what did Rangatira understand as they went away from the treaty? Those are the three things. The problem to me is that Ruth Ross actually does something really important and exciting. She locates the history in Māori experiences and Māori interpretation, but she also has, has placed the text as the explanation of the text and the debate on the text as being the historical problem. And I think that's, that in itself has become a problem in itself. So what I want to do is, 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 is try and, I've been trying to look at the treaty starting in Sydney, really, and Ned's book's really helpful and Trove is wonderful for actually looking at what is happening with Hobson in Sydney when he arrives, and then looking at what happens here. What's happening here has actually been written up quite extensively in the Australian press at the time, so Trove is wonderful in that. And I'm looking for the local and the immediate content. We tend to see the treaty signing and the treaty discussions as being 
these huge consequential constitutional discussions. Whereas most hui, most meetings, most events actually have one I was thinking about last week uh, as one of the dominant sorts of things. So I'm trying to locate those immediate sort of contexts that influence the making of the treaty. Um, now, I, I, I'm, I'm not going to say any more about Anne Salmon, except that Anne Salmon, uh, I think, is one of the people who does try to dissect the events and the people around the treaty. But the thing I find very interesting is that she gives the potted bios of all of the rangatira, but she does not explain their relationship either with each other when there's tensions or their relationship with the European world. And this is one of the things that I'm really trying to focus on in this discussion, relationships. Because the rangatira who sign the treaty and the rangatira who make these comments, how long have they known Henry Williams? Since he got off the boat. How long have they known um, Busby? Since he got off the boat. They've had intense, ongoing relationships over land, over constitutional issues, which Sam has been talking about, uh, over you know, all sorts of things. And when they come in to the treaty discussions, those relationships are key to what they're talking about. Okay? And then secondly, I'm really interested in the kind of ritual, the ritual of power and display that the treaty has. And I was always, you know, I loved that description of Pompalia. You know, Pompalia turns up at the treaty in his wonderful regalia as a bishop. And the, the poor old Protestant missionaries, here's my, here's my papist background coming out, are standing there in their sort of homespun dull suits. <laughs> and Pompalia realizes that in terms of status, he's number two as a bishop. So he hangs on to Hobson. This is his big day. It probably is his big day, actually. Um, he hangs on to Hobson, and the, the, the Protestant missionaries have to say, well, what are we going to do? You know? And they, they won't. Are we going to follow him into the tent? No, we can't do that. We'll have to come around back. We have to get another chair for Henry Williams so he can sit in another place. So that, that's a real context of understanding status, power, presentation, and the like. Um, so relationships and ritual. Um, now, why this has become, I think, so much easier is comes back to where Ned has taken us. Um, my view, Sam's view, and Ned's view, okay? I got into really feeling uncomfortable with Ruth Ross primarily because of her treatment of Henry Williams. Henry Williams, so here's the Henry Williams bit, I promised. Um, Henry Williams, to me, and again, I, I papist background, I have no reason, you know, no natural affection for the Reverend Henry Williams, or Marianne for that matter, you know. Uh, the two are really important together. Always think of them together. Um, the gender thing is important in that. Um, Marianne's the first Pagia feminist in many ways. Okay. Um, Williams is an honorable man. And I, my admiration for, William, for Henry Williams has grown, particularly when I'm working in, on Tamaki, you know. In 1835 and 36, people want to come back to Tamaki, but it's still too hot to come back to. William spends months negotiating carefully, Napui, Waikato, Marutuahu, Ngāti Whātua, going from place to place, bringing people together to make peace. He's a cautious yeah. So I, if anything, I'm prejudiced too much in favor of Henry Williams. I do not believe that he was responsible for a degree of deceit in translating the treaty. Okay. <laughs> then comes along Sam, who starts to talk about this thing about government, about making sense of government. And then Ned, you know, so back in, well, 2005, I sort of said, well, Henry Williams emphasized rangatiratanga because he had every reason to see the strengthening of tribal authority as fundamental to his interests and his understanding of the world. What Ned has done is to sort of say he could do that because there was a constitutional and a legal space in British constitutional thinking to allow that to happen. Now, not to take away the, anything that Ned says, if we go back to Paul McHugh, who was thinking about these things back in the 
80s. Paul McHugh writes a book, Māori Magna Carta, which I think he would just about completely repudiate almost immediately after he wrote it, because sovereignty, in that sense, what he's saying is that what lawyers understand about Aboriginal title can be read back into the treaty. He then became a historian and understood that you can't do that. <laughs> and by 1990, he's saying, ooh, sovereignty might be fettered or it might be divided. Now, fettered means that the treaty might make promises to people that are binding or, you know, on the colonising party, or maybe sovereignty can be divided. So he sees that in practice, and that's what Ned has, you know, developed. Unfortunately, Paul has now shifted on that position and said, when it comes to 1840, nah, they needed the sovereignty of the whole country because they saw it as becoming a settled European colony. It was not divided. So we've got these two positions. So then I have to step in as a historian. What's the historian's, the proper historian, not these legal historians. <laughs> what's the proper historian's responsibility here? And that is, is to look at context. One of the things that really surprised me when I first went to the tribunal is all the debates about the meaning of these land deeds. I'm thinking, why are they debating the, the text of these land deeds? For heaven's sake, people didn't even understand much of this. We've got to look at the context. We've got to look at what we can see is going on and going around. So that's what I'm trying to do in, in, in thinking through some of these things. So let's look at some of the issues that come through, okay? The first thing that I think is really important that many of the speakers understand is that Hobson is a naval officer who's been in charge of a ship, a ship with guns. And there's good evidence of the risks associated with giving those people too much power. He's been here in 1837. And it's really important that his understanding of New Zealand comes from that period when there is actually warfare taking place uh, in the Bay of Islands between Pomari, who's been pushed out of Kororareka, Ngāti Manu, uh, and Titore, who has come in and taken over that area of Kororareka in 1831, and then they're scrapping again in 1837. Now, of course, that is after the Declaration of Independence. So the Declaration of Independence and the establishment of the, um, um, what's the name, Confederation of Chiefs had been set up, but they're fighting with the other in 1837. So Hobson is going to come in and say, Oh, they're not going to do this, are they? They're too jealous of each other to be able to establish a government, a settled government. And that dominates his thinking. But between 18... But, you know, um, the Harriet affair is really quite important in understanding the power of naval officers. So in the Harriet affair, we have taking place in Taranaki, we have basically a Royal Naval ship with 50 soldiers coming and beating the hell out of a group of Taranaki Māori unjustly. A commission of inquiry in Britain finds very much that that was an unjust act, but it's a demonstration of British military power. And I think that has to be taken quite seriously when Hobson turns up on the Herald. Now, turning up on the Herald is interesting. All of the debates that take place in the treaty say, should he come or should he go? Should the governor come or should the governor go? Now, he shouldn't have been a governor. He was just a consul, as we heard this morning, I think. You know, he's issued, he's issued with two powers, to be a consul to negotiate a treaty and to be governor of any territory which is ceded to him. So he cannot become a governor until territory is ceded to him. And yet the debate that takes place in Waitangi is, should we have a governor? Should you go or should you stay? Now, does any, do how many of you know how Hobson came to think of himself as a governor? By the 5th of February. Well, the story is interesting and it re relates to the relationship between these two men. This is Captain Nias, who is bringing him in the Herald. He's the taxi driver, but he's in charge of the ship. And Hobson comes over and Hobson says, oh, there's a little bit of land I know of that was given to William IV 
fourth. And it was given to the William the fourth because shots was fired at Busby's house. That is British territory. I, I've been trying to find out exactly what the acreage is. It's probably not much bigger than this particular <laughs> plot of land. If anyone knows, please tell me. So Hobson tells Busby, whom he's sacking, um, I'm going to call myself a governor because I all, there's already this piece of New Zealand territory that is the crowns. I'm a governor of something, even if it's a quarter acre section. And Naya says, no, you're not. And Busby says, get off the grass. <laughs> so when Busby lands, when, when Hobson lands, he's, this is this quotation, um, Captain Hobson and Sweet with four policemen stuck up in the bow for a figurehead, put off in the cutter under a salute of 11 guns. Now the 11 guns was a salute for a consul. He wanted the salute for a governor and Nias wouldn't give, him, give it to him. So he arrives on shore at Kororaraka and he goes and, you know, gets himself on shore, gets his dignity up and then pronounces himself governor, lieutenant governor, and then makes two proclamations. And th these are really significant changes in the way that Europeans would have understood the coming of the crown. They'd caused quite a debate in Sydney in um, December when he arrives. And the, the two things consist of, first he shows that he wants to get sovereignty over the whole country. Now that is quite new because he has actually only recommended a factory system when he went back in 1837. And that factory system would have sort of said that, you know, we've already been mentioned today. And they were looking at the Bay of Islands, Cloudy Bay, and uh, Okeanga was it? Um, three places where factories might be set up. And the rest of the country would remain Māori land. Now that changes very dramatically by the time Hobson arrives. But in Sydney, this is the first that Europeans un get to fully appreciate because it's Hobson's recommendation on the factory system. So when Hobson's coming, this is the system that most people think is likely. And then the second thing that he says is, we're going to have an inquiry into all of your land dealings and only going to grant you land if you've kind of been a good lad. There's going to be a test. Now that causes a ruction in Sydney that Hobson, because he's been told, you're going to get a tough ride from these Europeans, calm them down, tell them they'll be looked after. And then he comes across. So he arrives in Kororarika on the 30th of January. Remember, only a half an hour after he arrives. And he makes this statement. It's really important that we understand where he is making it. Because Kororarika is the center of two major forces in the Bay of Islands at the time. The bishop and the European settlement of Kororarika. These people who are supposedly, you know, the scumbags of the earth, the white savages, the publicans, the, you know, gamblers and all the rest of it. But between 1837 and 1839, this society is changing. And in late 1839, it is taking off. There are lots of buildings taking place. They even have a race meeting. There's only two horses. Hobson, um, so um, Busby and Williams go to Sydney and they want to set up a foundling home to look after these children of Europeans who are abandoned children of European and Maori, Maori parents. Um, the Bay is politically divided between the Anglican elite and everybody else pretty well. And we, we today still buy that idea that these people were scumbags, you know, that they were not nice people. These are the people who are married into the Māori world. These are the people who are doing stuff 
starting to see, you know, they started this association, the Kōrerārika Association. They're starting to do some sort of local government. It's a bit vigilante-ish. No lawyers will be allowed, and they will horsewhip people who, you know, don't behave themselves. Um, but most importantly, they loathe Henry Williams. They see the missionaries as they were being depicted in London, Henry Williams in particular, as hypocritical land grabbers. Those pious people who are dominating the economic relationships with Māori at the expense of us, good, solid British or Jewish or American or French, whoever we happen to be, that world. So those people immediately see an enormous threat to their financial interests with the coming of the governor. Now, the people that they're talking to and the people who are coming, who are there, partly because of Titori's thing, so include um, people like, on the left there, Rewa, and his brother, um, Moka, they are resident in Kōrerareka. There are, figures vary between 150 and 300 people assembled on Kaurirāraka on the 30th, but around a third of those people are identified as Māori. So from that day, there is a huge debate about what the treaty means, what it's going to be, what the governor's role would be, and the world that many of these Māori around Kaurirāraka are in are kind of dealing with European, you know, European, what does this mean? So some people are, are talking to Henry Williams. Um, Wakanene is talking to John Hobbs in the Hokianga about what all of this might mean. But other people are talking to their connections in the, in the European world, which are financially and business-wise quite substantial. The other thing that I think is really important in understanding about this period is in, in towards the end of 1839, people start making money, lots of money, out of trading, not in land. And this is something I didn't realise. It, it's not important that Māori land is being sold. It's important that the deeds are being transferred for massive increases in value in the late 1830s. In, in, in the months. So land sold for 50 pound might three weeks later be sold for 100 pound, might three weeks later be sold for 600 pound. This is a European market. It's a financial market. It's not a land market. It's a sale of deeds. And I'm, I, I'm not going to go into why that happens, but quite significantly, one of those speculators in land is one James Busby who takes a piece of land at Waitangi and auctions it off in sections. Almost before Hobson arrives. So when we're looking at the Bay of Islands, we're looking at this connected world where people have these changing relationships. And we can kind of, we'll see that as we go on. If we look at the treaty debate itself, another thing that is fascinating is that there's a lot of criticism of landowners of Māori, of, of Europeans. All the named Europeans who are criticised, named as opposed to general traders, are part of the Anglican elite. They're all the missionaries, or Clendon, or, um, uh, you know, Richard Davis. That's not Richard Davis, that's not who I should have there. Um, I'm thinking of um, uh, Baker, Charles Baker. Charles Baker makes 900 pounds out of these trading deals by 1841. Um, hmm? Look, I, I'm, I'm not going to go. The, um, let's just say it's a hell of a lot of money, really. Um, yeah. Uh, well, the important thing is, uh, so why is it that those are the people who are being criticised? And I think what's that showing is that there's a shifting political landscape occurring in the Bay where the non-Anglicans are developing much more influence in their relationships with, with, with Rangatira. And there's also, I mean, I, the bishop gets blamed because you know, Anglicans can blame Catholic bishops. That's standard sort of stuff, particularly evangelical Anglicans. Um, and then these whites, these white savages, as I'll call them, 
But white savages are being defined by respectable Anglicans, respectable missionaries. And we've kind of bought that blanket view of them. And it is more complicated than that. Yes, they do drink a lot. There's no doubt about that. Um, but they are involved in, in this sort of, because of their intermarriage and connection and their children, we have this interest in intimacy. So we need to shift away from the idea of prostitution to the idea of intimacy, familial relationships, creating whakapapa and connections that can be affectionate and connected, not just like that. And save our men from grog. They even have this hellhole of the Pacific festival, for heaven's sake, to celebrate this image. And it, it's all over the iconography up there. Um, So this is to camera when we get to some of the speeches. Um, yes, they have it all, all, all. That man there, Busby, and that, they're the Wirramu. They have, my, they have my land, the land on which we stand today. This is to camera. Um, return me my land, Sator Williams. Return this land, pointing to Henry Williams. You, you bald head man there, you've got my lands. Oh, Governor, I do not wish you to stay. Go. Now, if we look at what they're saying about land, there's an interesting sort of repetitive thing going on here. They actually say, the land is gone. They say to the governor, give me back the land. And then they say, no, you're not going to do it. So go away. What's going on there? Well, if we look at the inquiry process that Hobson has thrown into this world, we get a hint from a letter from Bishop Broughton sent with Hobson to Henry Williams who explains this and says, don't worry about it, your lands will be fine. But if you are a grog seller in Kororarika and you've got claims to Māori land and you might have actually paid for it in grog, you might feel somewhat more threatened. Now, I'm actually going to go further than this and this is a bit more expensive exploitative, to say that a lot of the people who are coming from Sydney to invest in New Zealand in the late 1830s are coming to escape the regulations of New South Wales and Tasmania, and they're investing in a Māori world because of the freedom that it provides them. Kōrera, Bay of Islands in 1839 is an open, free market society. And by open, I say there are people from all sorts of different countries. There is a, at least three religious denominations. There's a debate over the nature of morality and public morality. And there's a freedom of financial and economic activity. All right. So... The idea of preemption, which is this retrospective thing we're going to investigate your titles. What's interesting, I'm just going to finish quite quickly because I want to finish with something else. These are some of the land dealings that Te Kemera had been involved with. What's quite interesting is that there's still sales late in 1839. And that one of the reasons is that, and one of the reasons I think why they're getting quite hostile is that there's a company formed, the Kodiraka Land, Kodiraka Land Company, formed to buy land, subdivide it, and profit from it. And, and some Māori rangatira are being caught up in that in late 1839. Um, uh, I'm just going to go... Oh, sorry. Ah. Baker. One of the other things I just want to say about this hui is that I regard this as a meeting of the Confederation of Chiefs. We often, as historians, say they never met. Well, they did meet. It was Waitangi. And, and you know, the invitations were set to the members and only the members. And Busby's change of the one modification to William's draft is to bring it in line with the Declaration of Independence. We should look at this event as a kind of a constitutional debate. But it's really important that we realise that the Europeans are part of this debate. In, you know, they enter in and out. 
Yeah. And I just want to finish with one interesting coincidence or not. Remember why Hobson claimed to be a lieutenant governor. Here's Kawatu. No, no, go back. What do you want here? We don't want to be tied up and trodden down. We are free. Um, I won't consent to your remaining. What? To be fired at our nights, to be fired at our canoes, no, go back. There's no place for you here. Um, where are we? Oh. Yeah, here it is. Go, return to your country. Mr. Busby has been shot at. Mr. Busby has been shot at. You will be shot at, perhaps killed. Mr. Busby could do nothing, but you are a man of war, Captain, and if you are killed, the soldiers will come and take a terrible vengeance on our countrymen. Now, this status thing that Hobson has taken upon himself, you know, to make himself the pompous lieutenant governor, you're not trying to be an equal, because a lot of it is about equality. Is this a coincidence? Because it's known in the European world that this is why he's making this statement. Is this a coincidence that we have this echo coming back in the treaty discussion? So just to finish by saying this, by the time we get to the debate at Waitangi, um, we can see that the participants are actually fully engaged in the key concepts that Hobson has brought with him. Now, I haven't talked about I'm just going to finish by saying, yeah, key concepts. This is a very sophisticated engagement with the ideas and the situation and the world that they're living in at the time. It's a, it's a fragmentary world. It's gone very quickly. And it's certainly gone after the, the Northern War in 1845. But I'm going to segue completely somewhere else to finish and simply say that at the end of this event, with these degrees of engagement, I've changed my chapter, rewritten the chapter, and just this week I've changed the title of it. And I've changed it, the title to Agreement at Waitangi, because that's what I kind of believe happened. Now, that doesn't mean that everything was sorted by any means, but I think there's enough common ground to say that there was an agreement in the end. But that would be another half hour at least. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you.